basically part of generative music is curating and and what you're talking about is you've got a lot of different possibilities usually about a quarter to a third of them work really well So you put these samples, and again, uh, you know, about a dozen others, you put them into the generator, and then what happens? It just kind of spits out some possibilities? Yes, actually. So it goes through some processes, and it uh, there's about maybe a, a lag of three or five minutes getting set up, and then it actually starts rendering the pieces, and you can watch it rendering each piece that comes out. I'm Sarah Fenske. This is St. Louis on the Air. And before we move on, I want to remind you that the biggest source of St. Louis Public Radio's funding comes from listeners like you. Because you value what you hear on St. Louis on the Air, donate today. Go to stlpr.org slash donate. That's stlpr.org slash donate. By day, Thomas Park is an IT guy. He currently works for the St. Louis Public Library. But he's also a musician and a composer with a special interest in ambient music. It wasn't until he enrolled in Launch Code's intensive coding classes that he realized how those two interests fit together. And Thomas Park has now written code that presents real opportunities for musicians like him. Basically, it allows people to input a series of sounds and it turns them into music. Like, for example, this. And that was one of thousands of pieces that Thomas Park's invention, the Generator, has spit out in a matter of just minutes. That makes Thomas Park really excited about the possibilities, and he joins us now to talk about them. So, Thomas Park, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah and everybody. I'm I'm really glad to be here today. Uh, and uh, to discuss this this invention with you guys. Yeah, so Thomas, this invention, this is pretty cool. When I say the generator has led to thousands of pieces of new music, I guess I'm not exaggerating on that. How fast can this code produce something new? Well, once you have all the settings set up, which basically involves choosing different sort of sounds for the voices or possibilities of sounds for the voices, and there's maybe six or seven different voices, um, you can make a song in about maybe a third of a second. So if you add that up, I don't have a calculator, but (laughs) a lot of songs very quickly if you want to. Many, many songs. So since you've developed this thing, how many would you estimate that you personally have had come out of it? Oh, I probably compose ten or 12,000 uh, unique pieces of music since I've started using it. And, and I know, you know, not all of these are as, as good as everyone. Like, you, you spend some time sorting them out. Of that ten to 12,000, have you been able to get some where you're happy with how it sounds? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, basically part of generative music is curating. And, and what you're talking about is you've got a lot of different possibilities. Usually about a quarter to a third of them work really well. And one out of every 10 is so good that I just, my hair stands up. Um, doesn't really, but, you know, it's really good. <laughs> but you're really genuinely good, so, yeah. excited by what this machine is is making. Well, I, I mean, I, I, uh, I haven't seen anything like this before myself. I know there's some products out there that are more commercial, but this is going to be a free um, open source module for anyone who uses Python code. So this is, I think this is the first time that musicians independent musicians and coders are going to be able to mass produce generative music based on samples. I I think this is a groundbreaking uh, situation for music. So. so, Thomas, I want to show people how this works. And as you and I have discussed, I am not somebody who knows anything about music composition. And so you kind of had to walk me through this. And I want to mm. walk our listeners through this, too. You were willing to share sure. some inputs with us, and, and you let us see mm. some of the music that comes from that. You, you shared more than a dozen inputs that went into creating, uh, again, created hundreds of pieces here. Um, but we picked out of the those dozen, just a few to give people an idea. So here is one of the base inputs. And here are the drums. And here is some organ. So for those of us thinking, okay, I might want to try this at home, where did you get those sounds from in order to make them an input into this machine? 
Um, well, I, I don't. I guess rather than be an ad, I can. I would just you know, if you look online for samples, there are many hundreds and thousands of different of, of sets of samples that I would urge people to purchase and use legally mm -hmm. because when you buy them, they become yours for use, which is what I do with my samples. So I found a collection. Most of those are from a, a hip hop sample set um, that I just absolutely love the sounds from. So Okay. So you put mm -hmm. these samples and again, uh, you know, about a dozen others, you put them into the generator and then what happens? It just kind of spits out some possibilities? <laughs> Yes, actually. So it goes through some processes and it uh, there's about maybe a, a lag of three or five minutes getting set up. And then it actually starts rendering the pieces and you can watch it rendering each piece that comes out and it has a little cue. My version does. Um, the final version, which is being developed by Jeremy Pavier um, in Ipswich, and that's going to be due out on Valentine's Day. Um, that's when we're going to deploy it. It may look a little bit different, and it's probably going to actually be faster and more effective hmm. than the one I use. Um, a few minutes the other thing was about just that, too long. Go ahead. A, a few minutes was just too long, Thomas? If you can't wait two minutes for a thousand people, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be even faster. It's kind of, it's amazing. Jeremy's done some good work. And one other thing about what he's doing is he's going to let people change the basic structure of the songs, too. So if you don't like my little groove that I've set up, you can have at it, do it, whatever groove you prefer. So. Hmm. Well, I want to show people yeah. that groove you set up. Um, as yeah. you said, you got so many options from this. You picked a few for us that you really liked. Let's listen to one of those. Mm -hmm. So, Thomas, as a musician, what about that track appeals to you? Well, I like um, I like how laid back it feels. And what's, what's interesting about a lot of what I get out of this program, when it works, it's very fluid sounding. And it's kind of got a little bit of abstraction, but not too much. Um, you know, a lot of compu computer music that, that I was hearing that was generative was very abstract. And it sounded like the uh, a little bit like the soundtrack to The Shining or something. And mm. just too crazy for me. Um, um, in spite of my open mindedness. So I was I was thinking about using samples to create this more fluid and laid back effect and very loungy effect. And I feel like that that piece maybe to me has some qualities. Yeah, I, I can hear that in that piece. I also want to mm -hmm. show people, though, not every piece comes out that well. Here's one that didn't work so well. So, Thomas, what about this piece made you say, you know what, this is not what I'm looking for here? I think if you, um, you know, although the basic background sounds about right, um, I can hear a little noisy sort of um, pad or organ thing that's that doesn't seem to fit the rhythm. Um, it's the kind of thing that I think that if you were a careful listener, you would pick up pretty quickly. And even if you weren't, you might start going crazy after a couple minutes. <laughs> You wondering, just wondering if your neighbor long. was, mo you might wonder if your neighbor was mowing the lawn or something, you know. Uh, so I thought that was a little distracting that part. So I did, I would curate that out. I would use that one. So. Okay, so you just maybe some extra sound in there. One of the inputs didn't end up meshing well with the other pieces. As, it was as that, that the, was if you listen to that pad sound, that was just a little bit off kilter. After a while, you'd really hear that. I hmm. think so. Yeah. Well, well, so Thomas, bigger picture. You've long been a big fan of ambient music. Could this machine also work if I plugged in, say, some bass? basic pop sounds. Could I end up with something that sounds more top 40-ish? Basically, one of the great things about this application is it's completely tailored to you, whatever your sounds, the, the, whatever you have and whatever you want to acquire or choose, those are the ones that the machine is going to use. Um, I'm more interested in allowing people to develop their own tastes and music uh, in, in different genres rather than telling them how to do it. So mm -hmm. this is a very wide open application and whatever sounds you wanted to use, you can use. So. And do you have any control then over the tempo, uh, depending on, on what inputs you're putting in? 
You can, um, the, at the, in the early stages, the only caveat would be that you would want all the samples to fit the same tempo. But if everything fit like a military drill of 220 BPM, it would sound fine when it when it rendered it, you know. Hmm. So it seems like this could be really fun to play with. Um, but what mm. do you see as a practical application of it going forward? Well, I think basically um, what I'd like to see is I'd like to see independent musicians um, learning how to code and I'd like to see coders learning how to do music because I think there's definitely a, it's a time for people to, to unify those two fields of thinking and process. And what I, well, another thing I'd like to see is for musicians to have as much fun writing music um, as they can because this takes a lot of the tedious uh, tasks out of it. You become more of a curator of different options that you've selected. And, you know, a lot of musicians aren't paid a whole lot nowadays to do a lot of work. And this really kind of puts things back into the fun region for musicians. Um, and um, and also, again, to promote the Python, I did want to add, I'm, I'm going to be teaching. I'll be available at Savvy Coders. I'm teaching Python this April. And anyone who's interested in Python, or, um, this is a great application um, to get into. And even if you're not, it's a great language to learn. It's very intuitive. So. Hmm. so you really feel like musicians could stand to learn this new skill. I'm curious for you, um, as we mentioned earlier, you've been a longtime IT guy. What made you decide to sign up for Launch Code's intensive uh, training classes at age 47? Uh, yeah, that's, you know, I was working at the library and I was providing just really light tech help. And um, I kept seeing these signs for Launch Code in I, I guess I'm a little bit mystical, but it's something sort of called to me about this idea of learning how to code. I felt like maybe this was something I should I should look into. Um, so I did run it by my wife and also my manager, and both of them were very, very supportive of this idea of pursuing code. Um, when I started the program, you know, right at first, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to do it. And for the first few weeks, it was pretty foggy. Um, I had used a lot of those parts of my mind in years, you know, since college. Uh, but after a few weeks, it really started to open up and, and was a real joy hmm. uh, to do. So, yeah. So, so you felt a part of your brain um, just sort of connecting in ways it hadn't for a long time. Yes, I think so. Because I think, you know, a lot of us, not all of us, but a lot of us who lead our day-to-day -day lives, um, we tend to shut down parts of our creative um, um, abilities and parts of our even harder working and more abstract abilities. I know um, I in high school, I really I was not good at calculus. And so when I graduated, I never wanted to see calculus again. But honestly, um, it would have done me a lot of good if I had kept pursuing it. <laughs> that kind of thinking can really help help with other things in life. I don't think people realize how important it is to think a lot and stay active mentally, you know, through their whole lives. Yeah, I appreciate that plug. I, I'm somebody where it's impossible to think that I would ever learn to code. But I think just being uh -huh. forced to learn something new is, is so good for all of us. Now you've got these newfound coding skills. I know you've got this generator. Uh, you have a developer working on it with you. Do you intend to go mm -hmm. further down that path of, of becoming a coder? Well, yes. I mean, I've actually already started some other projects in terms of what I call dream logic, which is a way of helping computers to think in, in terms of almost a dream logic instead of in a linear way. And that's an entirely different subject that I've started with because I'm, I'm trying to see if we can still use computers to relax us and entertain us instead of them working in a linear and, and, and rapid pace fashion. So I've got a lot of stuff going there. I, As far as I'm concerned, it goes as far as I, I can stay on this planet. So I guess um, as long as I'm here, I'm going to keep trying. So Well, that's great. And, and in the meantime, you've got this generator. I know your plan is to keep it open source so anybody can play around with it. If people don't have that coding knowledge, but they still want to give this thing a go, um, could they be of use to you as you're continuing to develop it? Well, I think so. I mean, anyone who's interested at all in this project should feel free to contact me. I mean, we, um, for one thing, we may get in a situation where we're able to take some of their sounds and cooperate with them and we can do the work on board here, um, depending on how many people are involved, you know. Um, if you're interested, you know, please contact. There's a, there's a lot to talk about and you don't have to be an ace coder. Um, to do it. so. Hmm. And uh, I don't know. I mean, do you feel like there's some way you could cash in on this? Or is that not at all part of, of where you see this going? Well, I just didn't think this, it didn't feel right to uh, to pursue money for this because um, I really feel it's the strong points are in terms of 
creating music and creating aesthetics and I didn't want to um, to hook that into um, anything financial. I and I didn't want people to not be able to use it because they couldn't afford it. I I've been you know I've been a struggling independent artist and I, at times very very struggling and I I just didn't want people to have to worry about that aspect of things. So. Well, I, I appreciate that. And it's been interesting to learn about this. I hope people who, who are interested in music will take advantage of this. And um, if people wanted to follow up with you or to, to check this out, what would be the best way for them to do that? Well, I mean, can I mention my email address? Sure. If you're Is willing, sure. If not, I can I can okay. happily forward emails to you if you'd rather no, I, not put I, that I, out I'll there. I'll mention it. It's just my, not my wife, so I hope she'll be okay with it. It's, a, <laughs> oh. it, um, it's mystifiedthomas at gmail.com. So it's one word, mystified Thomas, um, and then at Gmail com, just the Gmail um, suffix. And okay. um, yeah, I'm really good with email and I'll I get right back to people. So um, go ahead, ask any questions or anything you want, and I will definitely get back to you. So. All right. Well, Thomas Park, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, Honoring Arbor Day on April 26th with an ongoing commitment to sustainable stewardship and conservation of Missouri's forests. Choosewood.com.